Read about what God can produce in your life. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. The title of the message this morning is The Fruit of the Spirit is Long-Suffering. Long-Suffering. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for once again allowing us to be in the house of the Lord. I pray that we would get an understanding of long-suffering and what that means and how that can be produced in our life. And, and Lord, that's what we would be, that we would be a, a fruit-bearing people, that we would produce that, that spiritual fruit of seeing people saved and born again, but we would also produce the spiritual fruit here of, the, of love, joy, peace, and also the one we're looking at today, that of, of long-suffering. I pray that we'll be a long-suffering people. Uh, and do exactly what you would have us to do. And Father, if there's someone that is listening this morning, either in this room or over the internet, as I always pray, if they're not saved, then I pray that you would take something from this message to speak to their heart and show them that they need a Savior. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, as I said, we're going to look at long-suffering. And it, it's something that is very similar to patience, but it's not exactly the same thing. And we're going to look at the Greek words today to kind of show us how, how that is. Now this particular one is probably the hardest one uh, so far because I think many people don't really want to, they don't really see the need for this one. And the reason why is because they really don't like practicing this one. I mean, hey, we like love, amen? amen. We like peace. We like joy. We want those things. But long-suffering is like, eh, you know, and this one naturally does not come to us, uh, especially, I think, to Americans. It just doesn't, it doesn't come uh, our, our way. Uh, I know that, has anyone spent any time in a fast food drive through lately? It's not fast food anymore. No, it, you can't call it that anymore. It is something else. And I know why, and I'm not going to chase that rabbit today. I'm not going there. Uh, I already chased enough rabbits probably in Sunday school this morning. But anyway, we're, to Americans, we don't like waiting for anything. But, it, but human beings in general, we're not naturally born with patience or long-suffering. It's just, it's just not who we are. If you don't know that, then uh, go with children in a vehicle on a trip somewhere. If you don't have children, then rent them. You know, and you'll see what I mean. Last night, uh, you know, I was expected to get home kind of late last night. Not as late as I thought I was going to get home. Uh, you know, it's funny, I, I, I said this in Sunday school, I taught Sunday school this morning, and Brother Steve, you know, pointed out that I didn't get home until 11 o'clock last night, and yes, that was two hours past my bedtime, uh, but we were traveling along in the wee hours coming from Valdosta, and you know, like I said, it's, I don't know, 10, 11 o'clock, whatever, uh, we got home at 11, so it had to be around 10, we were driving, and I, you know, th those thoughts started coming to my mind, and I was trying to be as spiritual as I possibly could, that I'm going to stop this vehicle and kill John in a few minutes. You know, I'm going to kill him, you know. And I'm starting to think about it, you know, ways that I could kill John. No, I mean, I'm not going that far with it. But seriously, I wasn't the only one, okay? I think all the other three of us are like, John, you've got to stop, buddy. You've got to stop. You're driving us crazy. And that's just kind of how, how he was yesterday. That's how children can be. Uh, and most of the time, it's that impatience. They just, they're ready to get wherever we're going. Uh, as I've said before, in making trips to Quitman or to Valosta, you know, from here, that's an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half, something like that. We get the climax, and we're already here, and are we there yet? And that's, of course, not, not very far. So patience is not something that comes natural. And because it is unnatural, we need the Lord to produce this in our life. And this one is also hard, not just because it doesn't come natural, but it's also hard because it collides with other people and with everyday problems. Uh, the, in, in the preacher's outline in the Sermon Bible, it says this. I'm going to read a few things to you from there. It says, Long-suffering never gives in. It is never broken no matter what attacks it. You know as well as I do, this coming up week, we're going to have things that's going to attack long-suffering in our life. It's just going to happen. Well, long-suffering never gives in. It is never broken no matter what attacks it. It says pressure and hard work may fall upon us, but the Spirit of God helps us suffer long under it all. Disease or accidents or old age may afflict us, but the Spirit of God helps us to suffer long under it. Discouragement and disappointment may attack us, 
But the Spirit of God helps us to suffer long under it. People may do us wrong, but the Spirit of God helps us to suffer long. Long suffering never strikes back. It never seeks vengeance or retaliates. Once again, it suffers long. That's what it does. No matter what may happen to us this week, if long suffering is actually happening in our life, it will do what? It will suffer long. That's what it does. Like the others that we've already looked at in these, these the, the fruit of the Spirit, the, the love, joy, the peace. The joy and the peace, it, it comes from love. Love was the one that starts it. There's a reason why love is the first thing, the first trait mentioned. For the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, and from love comes these others. And so just like we got joy and peace from love, we get long-suffering from love as well. 1 Corinthians 13 is known as the love chapter. In our Bible, of course, it says the word charity, but it's agape love. That's what it is. Well, in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, it says charity suffereth long. Agape love suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. But what does it do at the beginning of that verse? It suffereth long. And as we get love from the Lord, we also get long suffering. And it makes sense that this happens in us. Because not only is God love, but He is also long suffering. And that's where I want to begin this morning with my first point. Number one, the Lord is long-suffering. Number one, the Lord is long-suffering. Numbers 14, 18 has that actual phrase in it. Numbers 14, 18 says, the Lord is long-suffering. If man was God, the world would have been destroyed a long time ago. If man was God, the world would have been destroyed a long time ago. One thing, we wouldn't be able to keep it up. That's one. I mean, no matter what changes that we make is... To, to, to battle whatever climate problem there may be, we cannot keep this planet up. It is God that put it where it is so that we could survive on it, so there could be life, but it's also God that has been very patient and long-suffering with His creation. God, you know, think about this. Think about all the wickedness that is against God because every sin, every iniquity, every transgression, every evil thought is against God, and yet He is long-suffering. Think about how much time He has given different groups over the years. Think about the Canaanites. The Canaanites were a wicked, wicked people. You study them a little bit, they sacrificed their own children to, to false gods. That was a common occurrence. They were a wicked and evil people, and yet God gave them hundreds, hundreds of years to repent and turn from that. When God is speaking to Abraham in the book of Genesis, He tells him this in Genesis 15. I'm going to read a few verses to you. Well, Genesis 15, verse 13 says, And He said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Year. So God has given Abraham a, a prophecy letting him know that his seed, that his future generations is going to, be, uh, going to be afflicted, going to be slaves for 400 years in Egypt. Then he says this, And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with a great substance. But then God tells Abraham that not only will they be slaves, but they'll eventually be able to leave, and they'll leave with a lot. They'll leave with plenty. And that nation that has been their slave, their, 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 their taskmasters, that nation God will judge. Of course, that nation was Egypt. In verse 15 of Genesis 15, if you continue to read it, it says, And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Now, all of this, this prophesying right here, is not going to happen to Abraham. We know that. Abraham dies way before his people ever go to Egypt and spend that time of slavery there. But it's the next verse that I want us to notice, and that's verse 16 of Genesis 15. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. The Amorites was one of the nations, one of the tribes of Canaan land of that, of that area. And what God says to Abraham is that your people are not going to leave Egypt until the fourth generation. They're going to be there for, for hundreds of years. And the reason why is because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. What does that tell us? It tells us that, yes, that the Amorites were a wicked people, and during Abraham's time they were not as bad as they would be four or five, six hundred years later. But it tells us something else, that God was very long-suffering to them, that God gave them hundreds of years to repent. 
I remember being in Sunday school one time. I, I wasn't teaching. I was one of the students. And uh, I remember there was a, another uh, student in there. He was somebody. He was actually the teacher's son. And he was, uh, I, I don't like saying this, I guess, but it, it's, it's just the truth. As he was backslidden. He was, he didn't really care to be there. He was just being there. He was in his 20s. This was, a, like I said, an older, this was a college and career class. Uh, and he just, he really was there as a bad spirit to his mom as she's teaching, actually. Uh, and I remember us talking about something like this, you know, God judging the Canaanites or something like that. And I remember him saying, I mean, this, it's, it's amazing some of the things that you remember, some of the things that people say that you won't ever forget. But I remember him saying, well, if God did that, then he's not a very good God to that effect. And what the man did not take into account was this, that God was long-suffering to the Canaanites. He gave them hundreds of years to repent, and they didn't do it. He did the same thing for Israel. They meant all the time that he gave Israel. Think, I mean, let's just say this. You know, we as human beings, we have a tendency to want vengeance. We want our words said. We really do. We want to retaliate. If someone does something against us, our natural instinct many times is to get them back. It's a good thing when that's not your natural instinct anymore. That means the Lord has done something in your heart really great. But up until that point, that's your natural instinct. Vengeance is mine, thus saith Brent, or whoever it may be. We want that. Let's think about the book of Judges, for example. After about the third time, probably, of the children of Israel going against me or going against you, we have destroyed them right on the spot, even if they would have made it to the third time. They might not even have made it there. Maybe after that first time, we'd have taken care of them. But God was patient towards them throughout the book of Judges and throughout the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles and pretty much all the prophetic books. This is what this is about, that God was long-suffering to his people. But you know what? He was long-suffering to us too. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. Some people, a promise doesn't mean anything. But when God makes promises, you know that he's going to keep them. But it says, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He is what? He is long-suffering to usward. Our nation, I believe right now, is getting the beginning stages, I guess you can say, of judgment. It's what it is. It's judgment. Let's go on and call it what it is. It frightens me to think about it, of what may be about to happen to us. When you have restaurants right now that won't open indoors, not because of COVID-19, but because of what the government has done, that's what's going on right now, because of what the government has done. Because the government is playing a game right now, and it's a very dangerous game that we're all going to pay for. And the reason why the government is playing the game that they're playing with right now is because they have totally turned their back on God, and they did that a long time ago. And that is why they're making so many foolish decisions one right after another that is going to harm us for many days, I am afraid. But the thing is, is we deserve it. We deserve foolish people in charge that don't have a clue what they're doing. We deserve it. It is the judgment of God. We deserve it. And we deserve it because of what we've allowed to take place in our nation. We cannot look down on those heathen, uh, pagan Canaanites that sacrifice their children to false gods because what have we done? Millions upon millions of abortions have been, have been administered, have been done. We, we didn't call it abortion, murders. Millions, 50, 60 million innocent babies have been murdered in our country and we're supposed to all be okay with it. It's a law. Yet God is long-suffering to us as well. He's long-suffering to us as a people, as human beings, but he is also long-suffering to us as Americans. But the thing is, his traits are always in balance. His traits are always in balance, but he is a long-suffering God. And he wants us, right now, no matter what may be about to happen, no matter what circumstances we're facing, he wants us to be a long-suffering people. And we can be that, but only through him. We can only be long-suffering through him. Remember that the fruit of the Spirit is something that comes from God. It's not something that we do. It's not a work. It is something that God has produced in our life. This is God's nature. This is God's traits that are being produced and recognized and seen in our life. And that leads me to my next point. 
Number two, not only is the Lord long-suffering, but number two, the difference between patience and long-suffering. Number two, the difference between patience and long-suffering. What is the difference? I want you to leave Galatians, and I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to do a little bit of turning today. 2 Timothy chapter 3. There's something in this verse I, w- I want us to notice. The context is, is end times you know, stuff, perilous times, but that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at one thing in particular in verse 10. It says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Now this is the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy after he's talking about all these evil things that are going to be taking place in the end of days. And now he's kind of talking about his own testimony. Now I don't believe he's tooting his horn or anything like that. He's just stating some facts and this is through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that he's doing this. And he says, you know what? It has been fully known my doctrine. This is something you've been able to see. You've been able to see my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith. And then he says long-suffering. That people have been able to see this. And by the way, the fruit that is produced in our life, people will be able to see. But you keep reading, it says long-suffering, charity, and then it says patience. We have these two words, patience and long-suffering. Now, is the Apostle Paul repeating himself, or are these two different things? Is long-suffering and patience two different things? Or are they the same thing? They're not the same thing, but they're very close. And the way we can tell the difference between them really is by the two Greek words that are used here. The Greek word for long-suffering is makrothumia. Makrothumia. Now, what it means is is forbearance or, or fortitude. It is endurance. In the New Testament, long-suffering always comes from makrothumia. It's always that Greek word that is translated into long-suffering. Now, the Greek word here for patience is hupomene. Hupomene. And it means cheerful or hopeful endurance. So it means endurance like the other, but it is cheerful or hopeful endurance. Most of the time in the New Testament, patience comes from this Greek word. Most of the time. It's maybe like one or two times in the New Testament that patience comes from Mac, uh, Mac Rothumia. But most of the time, it is from this one, Hupomene. Here in verse 10, long suffering is Mac, uh, Mac Rothumia, and patience is Hupomene. Now say, what is the, okay, the difference is, all right, we got, you know, one of, one of them's endurance, the other one's hopeful or cheerful endurance. That's really not a big difference. But let's go a little deeper so we can understand this. See, the difference between these two Greek words mainly has to do with where we get patience and where we get long-suffering. What I mean by this is the origin. How do I have patience? How do I have long-suffering? How can I have this? Because see, the thing is, how do I have patience is actually different than how I can have long-suffering. That's the difference in these two words. That's the difference between hupomene or macrothemia. So where do we get patience? How do I have patience? Well, the same Greek word for patience in 2 Timothy 3.10 where we're looking at is also the same one used for patience in James 1.3. In James 1.3, it says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now, we know that. You've heard people say this, Well, I, I want patience, but I don't want to pray for patience. Because in order to get patience, how do you get patience? But through tribulation, through trials. We read that in James 1 3. Knowing this is the trying of your faith worketh patience. Worketh hupomene. Hupomene, that Greek word again. But we read the same thing in Romans 5 3. In Romans 5 3, it says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Hupomene. All right, well, we have another example of where we can get patience in Romans 15 4. Romans 15, 4. In James 1, 3 and Romans 5, 3, we learn that we get patience from the trying of our faith, from tribulations. But Romans 15, 4 gives us something a little different. For whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. We just looked at this verse on Wednesday night, actually, when we're looking at inspiration. For whatever things were, were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now what these verses teach us is that patience is something that can be learned. We can learn patience. The way that a person can learn patience, though, according to the Bible, is from two things. 
We can learn patience from tribulation, and we can also learn patience from the Scriptures. From reading the Scriptures, we can get patience. Maybe it is from reading about people like Ruth or Esther or, or David or Daniel, any of these. Because that's what Romans 15, 4 said. For whatever things were written, the Bible, written aforetime, were written for our learning that we through patience in comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So patience is something that we can learn. Have you ever been patient about something and then after the fact you were proud of yourself? You ever been there? I've been there, okay? If y'all are too good to be there, I've been there. Well, I've waited in line, and I waited at that, that, that dumb red light down there that I, I waited all the time. I've waited at that thing, and I've sat there, and I, I've, I've, been, I've been pious. I've been thankful. I've been praying even. I've listened to a song on the radio. I'm waving at people, folks. And then I drive on, I get down to Tractor Supply, and all of a sudden I think, I was patient today. Well, amen. Or someone cut you off in traffic, and I didn't say, oh, we live in your world now, don't we? Because I don't, that's, that's, my, that's my cussing. I don't use cuss words. God took them things out of my mouth a long time ago. But so my way of cussing is, you idiot. You know, that's, my, that's Christian cussing right there. You idiot. Or, or uh, the, the worst one of them all, you stupid idiot. So you're not just an idiot, you're a stupid idiot, which do not say this at home, children, okay? It is wrong. But anyway, uh, so usually what I say now, because I'm not allowed to say the, the S word, which I've already said a couple of times today, which I do apologize for, I, I'll say is I, we live in your world. Well, see, on those days when they come out in front of me and I'm like, hey, how you doing? Yeah. I've experienced patience. It's a sense of accomplishment. I feel like I am growing as a human being. And maybe that is why patience, hupabene, is cheerful endurance. You're happy with yourself. You feel like you've done something. But long-suffering is different. Long-suffering is different because it directly comes from God. Now, don't get me wrong, and we'll see this in a second. Patience comes from God, too. I'm not denying that. But long-suffering can only come from God. You did not have a sense of accomplishment when you have long-suffering because you didn't do anything. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is not something that we're doing. It is something that is being produced in our life. So I cannot be proud of my, my love, my joy, my peace, my long-suffering because the moment I'm proud of those things, apparently it's not God doing it, it's me doing it. Because this is not something, once again, I'm not practicing long-suffering. It is happening in my life. So you don't have that sense of accomplishment. You don't even think about the fact that you were long-suffering. See, the fruit of the Spirit never causes us to praise ourselves. It never does. It just happened because God is producing fruit in your life. People that are truly walking with God and has the fruit of the Spirit in their life, they're not walking around thinking about how great they are. It's not happening. Because if they were, they're manufacturing it. And the fruit of the Spirit is not manufactured. So this long suffering right here is not manufactured. It's something God is producing in you. Fruit, once again, that you did not even notice because you were so focused on the Lord. Let me give you an example. Once again, the word hubamine, patience, is cheerful enduring. The other one, macrothumia, is just long suffering. You're not cheerful about it. It's just happening. But you're not stressed over it. You're just, you're just living your life. Let me give you an example in Joshua chapter 6. Joshua 6, they're finally, they're finally getting into the promised land, you know, around this point. Joshua's their leader. They're behind him 100%. You read that in Joshua chapter 1. And they're happy. They're excited. And I, I imagine some of them are probably thinking, someone like Brother Ronnie, you know. Brother, Brother Ronnie's a man's man over there. He is. He's probably thinking. He's probably thinking, all right, when are we knocking down that wall over there? We're about to tear them Jericho people up, Okay. That's probably what's going on. But see, God's talked to Joshua. And now Joshua tells the people what we're going to do. This is what he says. The priests are going to carry the Ark of the Covenant. And we're going to have these priests over here. They're going to have these trumpets. And all you people, you know what you're going to do? You're going to follow them. And we're going to walk around the city. And then we're going to go back to the tents. Okay. We're scaring them. That's what we're doing. Tomorrow we're going to kick their tail. On the second day, no, we're going to do the same thing. On the third day, we're going to do the same thing. On the fourth day, we're going to do the same thing. On the fifth day, 
We're going to do the same thing. And on the sixth day, we're going to do the exact same thing. We'll walk around the city one time while these priests are blowing these trumpets. And guess what? We're not allowed to say a word. We're not allowed to say, hey, we're about to, we're about to beat y'all down. We, we can't do that. We're quiet. Not a sound. And on the seventh day, you're going to get up really early in the morning. And you're going to walk around it seven times. And then when the trumpets blow, you're going to make this great noise. And the walls are coming down. You know what you don't read about in Joshua 6? You don't read about this. Joshua, really? Um, come on. They're scared of us. Let's just go beat down the wall. Why do we have to walk around it seven times? Why do I have to walk around it three times? Why do I have to do why do we have to do this seven days in a row? You don't read about that. But you also don't read about their great long suffering or patience. You know why? Because this is something that God has produced in their life. They're not thinking about it. They're just following the Lord. They're not anything great. That's the difference between patience and long-suffering in a lot of ways. Now, don't get me wrong about patience. It can come directly from the Lord as well. There's a biblical precedent for that, and that's Colossians 1.11. Strengthen with all might, according to His glorious power, unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. What I am saying is, is these two words are both there once again in a verse. We've read about, the, it's, it's, I think it's three or four times in the Bible where in a verse or in a passage you have the words patience and long-suffering are both used and they're coming from two different Greek words. So apparently they're not the same thing. There's something different. And what we read about long-suffering in the Scriptures is that it's something that we can only get from God. I think lost people can be patient. They cannot be long-suffering. So, the difference, or the main difference, in these two is, the, the, is that it takes something to, or circumstances to get us patient, but it takes God to make us long-suffering. It takes tribulations or trials to get patient, but it takes God, once again, to make us long-suffering. Number three, the impact of being long-suffering. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Number three is the impact of being long-suffering. And I ask you to turn to 2 Corinthians 6. There should be a desire within the believer to make an impact. Right now, believers are not making a very big impact. The ones that are making a, a big impact, the impact is a bad impact. It's not a very good one. Right now, there are many people in our country or in our world that is making a big impact but they are making it for the devil and for themselves. And we Christians are not really doing much of anything right now. But see, God, when he saved us, he also put a desire in us to make an impact. Say, how do we make an impact? Through the gospel. That's how we do it. Well, see, when it comes to being long-suffering, that fruit that is produced in our life, that is seen in our life, you know what it does? It produces an impact. People see it. We may not necessarily see it, but other people will see it. So the first thing I want to say about this one, the impact of being long-suffering is letter A, long-suffering is a sign of a Christian. Long-suffering is a sign of a believer. In 2 Corinthians 6, it says, and there's a few verses here, that's why I want you to turn here. Look at verse 1. It says, We then, as workers together with them, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Now notice, right off the bat in this chapter, he's talking about being, we're workers together. Verse 2, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. All right? Now is the day of salvation. We're workers. Now is the day of salvation. Verse 3, Given no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. All right? We don't want the ministry blamed. So, to my, you know, given no offense, the offense of the, of the Corinthian church time and time again, is their worldliness. Because of their worldliness, because of their backbiting, because of their fighting against one another, so often what ends up happening is that they're worse off than the lost people. They're doing things that the non-believers are doing, and that is even an accusation that Paul makes to this church. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. We don't want the ministry blamed. But in all things, approving ourselves. Approving ourselves as the ministers of God. Approving yourselves as the ministers of God. What does, it, what does it mean to be a minister of God? A servant of God. Showing that you are a servant of God. 
in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. What these things are right here is these are signs of a believer. In much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in stripes, in imprisonments, and even down there further by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering. Long suffering is a sign of a believer. It is a testimony of a believer to be long suffering. So we're talking about making an impact. Let it be. Long suffering is a blessing to the church. Long suffering is a blessing to the church. In Ephesians chapter 4, we read how this works. In Ephesians 4, verses 1, 2, and 3, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Well, worthy of that vocation. It says, with all lowliness and meekness. So you're not proud. And then it says, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He is writing to this church right here to walk worthy of the vocation where they are called. And he says, this is how you're supposed to walk, with lowliness, with meekness, and then with long-suffering. And right after saying you need to walk with long-suffering, he says, forbearing one another in love. Being able to bear in one another. And then after that, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There needs to be a unity among the brethren. And the way that new, uh, uh, unity can really come about is by us being a long-suffering people. So long-suffering is a blessing to the church. It is an example to the younger believers. It is an example to the new believers to, to produce the fruit of the Spirit, including long-suffering. And then the last one I'm going to give you, letter C. Long-suffering is a witness to those that need Christ. Talk about making an impact. Long-suffering, I've already said it's a sign of a believer. Long-suffering is a blessing to the church, but in particular, long-suffering is a witness to those that need Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, I want you to turn there too. 1 Timothy chapter 1, or write the verses down if you don't want to turn. But 1 Timothy 1, I want you to see these verses. Here we're talking about long-suffering is a witness to those that need Christ. 1 Timothy 1.15 this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to do what? Save sinners. That's why he came. He didn't come just to be a martyr. He didn't come just to teach something good. He came to the world to save sinners. And then Paul says, of whom I am chief. All right, so this is worthy of all acceptation that Christ has come to save sinners. Then it says in the next verse, verse 16, how be it for this cause. What cause? What cause? Well, the salvation of sinners. That's what's, being, that's what's going on here. How be it for this cause I obtained mercy? That in me first, Jesus Christ, might show forth all long-suffering. Why? 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 You know, he said, this is my cause. This is why I got saved, to, to give out the gospel so that sinners could be saved. And that Jesus Christ is going to show forth all long suffering in me, but why or how? Then it says, for a pattern. For a pattern to them which should have to believe on him to life everlasting. The long suffering of Paul, in particular, for him, but it should be for all of us, is for a pattern to them which should have to believe on him to life everlasting. It's a pattern, it's an example. It is something that people should see in our life. So the Lord is long suffering. And the Lord can only produce long-suffering in our life. And we need to be long-suffering because it makes an impact. So the question is, how long-suffering are we? Well, in order to be long-suffering, we've got to focus on the Lord. We've got to get our eyes on Him. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. Father, thank You for your word today and for the opportunity to preach and teach, Lord. I pray that it was something that was received in a way, Lord, where people could learn. 
that once again, as we've already seen with the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, this is not something that we do or produce. We can try, but Lord, this is something that you produce in our life. So Lord, we need you. We need you, of course, for salvation, for those that have not been saved. We need you for guidance and direction to show us, Lord, what, what we, we need to do and where we need to go. We need you to be able to give out the gospel because of our own fear and infirmities. We need you when we go through sickness and disease. We need you when we are facing trials and tribulation. But we also need you in order to have, in order to have love, joy, peace, or to be long-suffering. So Lord, I pray that once again you direct our thoughts to you, that we would not look around to people before we look to you, that we would look to you first, that we would have a Christ-first mentality, that our focus would be on you, that we would seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's what we would do, Lord. And then you would direct us where we need to go and that fruit would be produced in our life to make that impact that it needs to make in the society that we live in. Lord, please do that in our heart and our life. Help us to see the need of the fruit of the Spirit and be in that right testimony. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Could you please stand with me? As Brother Chris leads...